gaze into my eyes. I think that's uh, <laughs> mesmerizing. <laughs> yes, it's very mesmerizing. I have plans for you with dripstone. With dripstone? Yes. That sounds ominous, Lash. I don't know if I trust you. No, I don't trust myself as well. We will see. I, I will do some experimenting on myself first. Okay. To make sure that it goes through armor. No, I mean, uh, to it's going to be very gentle. Uh, was I supposed to hear that or no? No, Dad. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you for the mod. It was amazing. Uh, your hair looks lovely today. Uh, I love your wisdomous eyes. And uh, I see myself out. Yes. Off you go, Lash. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back to Trifecta. Today we begin construction on Penrose Central, the main train station and logistics hub of our base. In fact, as you can see, I did already make a start on this project and we're kind of past the point of no return with the mess that we have down there. So I guess I'm committed at this point and you guys are coming with me. But first, I am very happy to announce that Trifecta, the mod pack, is now available on CurseForge for you all to download and enjoy the same way that we play here on the server. It took a while to put everything together, it's my first time releasing anything on Curse. And so I would also like to give a massive thank you to Taz. I know that you're watching Taz, thank you for everything. Many of you guys will know Taz from the Divine Journey 2 days of the channel, which was a very long time ago by now. But he has helped me out tremendously throughout the years, and yeah, especially with the release here of Trifecta. And also now included in Trifecta is a brand new data pack written by Taz. So do you guys remember when we constructed this workshop, we used to have a little contraption in the corner, which was two deployers and a mechanical drill. As it used to be the case that we were unable to strip the colourful azalea woods using the create mechanical saw, like you're supposed to be able to with the vanilla woods for example. However, thanks to Taz's data pack, as you can see the recipe shows up here in JEI, and it should be possible to strip all of the colourful azalea woods using this method. And I have a feeling this is going to help us out a lot today. We are going to need uh, quite a bit of wood for this station. But yeah, if you guys are interested in playing Trifecta, make sure to check the curse page. And if you have any issues, feel free to head to Discord. I know that myself and many others are always willing to help out wherever we can. So in the last episode, we built this massive bone meal farm. I had so much fun putting all that together. And I have been working on the farm a little bit. I added some more redstone controls, which I'm going to show you guys later in the video. But for now, let's get straight into Penrose Central Station here. We have a lot to cover today, and I suspect this is going to take me quite some time to get figured out. But I'm going to take you guys on the whole process. We need to design the station. We need to uh, place it here in the world. And there's also some extra considerations we have to make with the existing things that we have built. Also, there is no way it's going to fit in one episode, so we are going to break this down into two different segments. The first is everything to do with the trains themselves, which is going to be located under underground here where we're standing. This is where all of the train logic is going to be located. All of the tracks, all of the passenger platforms, all of the cargo loading, all of that is going to be around Y67, which is roughly where we're standing right now. And the second section is everything above ground which is our objective for today. We are going to build the passenger terminal entrance. And I'm thinking that we build it roughly on this level right here, maybe a little bit higher. And this will serve as the main entranceway to Penrose Central. Also somewhere we can sell train tickets. <laughs> Hopefully we can make this a profitable endeavor. And yeah, potentially we can also integrate some other cool create contraptions, which I'm hoping we can get to if we get enough building done today. Oh yeah, of course it starts raining. <laughs> I feel like every single time I hit record it starts raining. That's perfect. But uh, hey, look at this. Look at what Lash Mac has done. It seems he's been on a bit of a marketing campaign around the server. And look, we can't have this. Look at look at this. He's blocked our he has blocked our track shop at Lash. Hey, these guys are in diamond armor. He must be making some serious cash. But he was in fact at our base as well. He changed our flag to purple and left us one wheel short. He messed with our villagers, and I'm surprised they're all still there. They are all still there, which is good. <laughs> and he also left us these system messages, which give us advertisements around our base. Threefold, you really need to shop. <laughs> I managed to get one removed, but I'm pretty sure I missed one, uh, as I've heard it a few times. He's got them connected to daylight sensors, so th yeah, those go off every now and then. Welcome customer, 
Do not steal from darkness. No, don't worry, Lash. I'm not going to steal from you. I'm, I'm actually here to buy some stuff. Uh, precision mechanisms is what we're after here. One stack for four... Wait, one stack for four... One stack of mechanisms for four diamonds? I, I must be reading that wrong. I'm going to have to double check with him that price, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to buy these two stuff. Oh, I didn't bring any diamonds with me. In fact, Lashmac was here a few days ago. He left his ender chest and we ended up doing a little trade within McFold's. He bought five stacks of McFold's burgers for 10 diamonds. And I guess we're just about to give them back after we go and buy those mechanisms. So some time later, we're back here at Penrose Central. And I've been putting together a couple of ideas, which uh, we're just going to get straight into. I think it's going to be easier today if we get something written down, so to say. A blank page is always the hardest thing to write on, and it, it took me so long to prototype this idea. However, a lot of building requires a lot of building blocks, so let's just take this back to the beginning, shall we? The construction of the station started with the clearing of some land after the main train entrance which has already been built here out the front. I used our modified and expanded tunnel bore and it made very quick work of the land in our way. I also made sure to save all of the blocks it mined since we can use it to build our new station. After things were mined out, it was time to choose a block palette and design aesthetic for the station. Once that's done, then we can move into the planning and layout phase. There are also some non-negotiable parts of this assignment which we need to consider to make the station fit its surroundings. The first block that I thought would be a good fit for the aesthetic of the station is limestone, added by the create mod. Limestone spawns in veins underground and we happen to have one just underneath our bone meal farm. Okay, with haste too. Yes, it's instamine, perfect. Although there is deep slate in amongst this stuff, so maybe this wasn't even worth it. After the collection of limestone, I paid a visit to our clay farm, since I also want to carry the theme of brick and granite that we have in the pillars on the entrance to the train yard. So the inputs to the clay farm is dirt, which you guys pointed out is in fact renewable. However, this time we just used all of the dirt taken from the massive hole in the ground that was just created. One of the reasons why I keep everything on this server and we do not void items. Another suggestion lots of you guys made for the clay farm is to implement trap doors as a way to disable the water wheels, in addition to the on-off switch. I opted to make it a separate switch, so I connected a note block up to a redstone link, and that activates waterlog trap doors, preventing the flow of water and therefore disabling the farm. This way we can save valuable server performance, and it gives us an extra button to push. Or a note block, I guess is the case here. In that time, we had also converted lots of the dirt we fed the system into mud, and then into clay, which was loaded into the trains and sent back to the base to be used in the new station. Part of the aesthetic also involves wood. I chose to keep using walnut azalea wood, since it's used in all of the existing buildings. I thought we might want to keep at least some commonality between the builds in the area. Unfortunately, we don't have a proper tree farm just yet, so I cobbled together a mechanical piston, saw, dispenser, and smart observer as a way to get some wood in a semi-automated fashion. Not the best setup, but remember, we are doing the one seed challenge, and that also extends to wood farming. So we need to find some creative solutions to our acquisition of crops, plants, and wood. Coming back again to the brick and granite theme we have, I thought it might be wise to gather some more granite, since we didn't get quite as much as I would have hoped for from the excavation. So I moved our beacon into various locations to be able to harvest lots of granite and andesite. As you can see, we do also use andesite frequently in the pillars on the entrance to the train yard, and it's going to feature heavily in the station building design. Lots of the other material for the station we had in very large quantities already, including stone, stone brick, cobblestone and spruce wood. So those were crafted into different variants like walls and slabs. Finally, we just had some of the miscellaneous blocks like glass, dark oak, various forms of lighting, and copycat blocks, which are crafted from zinc. I made sure to keep an eye out for zinc ore whilst collecting andesite and granite. And with the materials collected, I was itching to start building, and we could begin the construction on phase one, the terminal.
my goodness, guys, here it is. <laughs> Penrose Central Station, here we go. If that didn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, then I don't know what does. That was epic, but we still have a long ways to go with this station. However, checking out the interior space, this thing is huge. And uh, to be honest though, I actually think we could have been, we could have went bigger with this thing, right? And yes, there is also a potential missed opportunity to go for a Penrose triangle shape, but I did try to keep the shape as interesting as possible and not just a big rectangle, as is often the case with many older train station designs in real life. Lots of the new ones are actually quite crazy, but uh, yeah, this is kind of a, a mix of all different types of styles. Yeah, as you can see, we got the limestone in there, we got the walnut azalea, we got the brick and granite look, the same that we have on the workshop. Lots and lots of, an so, so much andesite. It was <laughs> so much andesite here. Like all of this is andesite, this is layered andesite. And then we have polished cut andesite, and then there's the regular cut andesite somewhere, I think up on the, up on the windows up there. Yeah, walking around here to the back, it's fairly plain on the back, but we I might have a little idea on what we can add right on the back side here, so I, I deliberately kept it quite plain. But I, uh, I did try to add some texture in the walls just with some missing bricks occasionally. So yeah, nothing super fancy on the back side here. And then it's more or less a direct copy on the side, and of course we've got a lot of terraforming to do around here. It's, uh, it's placed a little... Well, the way it's placed, to be honest, isn't something I love, but uh, there is a reason for it, which we're going to cover a little later on. Mostly, I'm not sold on how close this barn is. I, I really wish we could move this now. It kind of feels like this is in the way, or uh, it doesn't fit next to it, but maybe it's just because of the surroundings. Yeah, maybe with the removal of all of this land here, it's going to make it feel like it belongs. Oh yeah, there is also that huge stone circle in the, on the top, or cylinder, I guess is what it actually is. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a big clock tower appearing from the back? Oh, this looks so cool from down here. But you can imagine this is all developed under there. We we have the whole rail system in. Oh, that's going to be that's going to be so cool. I haven't quite got around to the design of the clock tower yet, but I did make sure to mark out a space for it. So right now it's just stone up there. Let's see if we can hit this. Oh, I missed. That's a miss, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a miss. Second time around. That, that looks too far, almost. Yeah, so the roof side here is also something I'm not entirely sold on. We might try out different combinations. This deep slate brick might end up getting switched out. And same with the dark oak. I just went with dark oak because that's what we use on all the other builds, but um, mm, I'm not so sure. I'm not exactly sold. And I didn't want to use any more polished andesite <laughs> because this is almost used too much as it is. We have that little trim around the middle. It's also used in the base and it's, it's like used all over the place, especially in this front section here. We need to find like another two blocks that are going to work in the middle roof section. But for now, I just decided to go for deep slate bricks. And yeah, big exterior builds, I think is one of the hardest things to do in Minecraft, especially when you have to do roof sections and like tie it all into the terrain. I am definitely out of practice on this. But I, uh, yeah, there's also some skylights over here. We got the new andesite bars, which is new in this version of Create. As we found out last episode, lighting really makes all the difference in a build. So uh, there's a, a few more lights to integrate, but we also got the copper lanterns right there. Yeah, the interior space on this just feels right, you know? When you get that feeling, it just feels like a train station. <laughs> I kind of like it. I really like it. Alright, so back over here at the bone meal farm, I thought I'd show you guys some of the new additions and redstone controls that were implemented. Oh, and I also brought some glowstone. I thought we could hide it underneath some moss carpet as just an easy and cheap way to light the area without the need for torches. Is that going to be enough light? Hmm, potentially. We might have to add some more here. Yeah, I guess this is a little nicer. <laughs> Definitely no torches here. But uh, yeah, as you can see, I added this redstone control panel. Oh, and of course, this thing is now a bone meal farm, not a bone me farm. Do you guys remember we had the issue here with the display board not being long enough? And the solution is very simple. It comes in the form of this clipboard from Create, which is brand new in this version. You can also give it to the schematic cannon to make a material checklist, which is way better than the vanilla book, is way more readable. And you can also uh, mark off items manually this way. 
It's also able to mark off the item automatically if you, if you give the cannon the correct item. <laughs> Look at this, 400 cut that andesite. And this is just half of Penrose Central. So many materials. Anyways, the other function of the clipboard is you can use it manually. And you can write a checklist and, uh, of course, check off items. And since we have bone meal written in here, we can specify this for line 2. And that is a much more elegant way to display the amount of items that we have. I also found it was necessary to change the display link back here, which is how we send the data to the display board out front. So it used to be on list items, but this also gives you the name of the item after the number and it abbreviates. It doesn't give you the full amount, like we have over here. But yeah, switching it to amount of matching items just gives you the amount in full. And we can specify that we want bone meal written on line 2 with the clipboard. So yeah, as for the control panel, we have a button, which is just a manual farm toggle. And the second one is what I'm going to call the automatic override feature. So I wanted a way to turn the farm on and off automatically based on the amount of bone meal that we have stored. But we don't necessarily always want that to be the case. For example, let's say we're at the workshop and we're picking up a bunch of items and we know we're going to take those out to the industrial district, which is several hundred blocks away. That would unload the farm and this farm does not respond well to being unloaded when it's running. So that is what the automatic override feature allows us to control. So back here we have two threshold switches which are capable of measuring the amount of items that we have stored. And these are inverted, so if we have less than 90% it's going to output a redstone signal. Once we have over 90% it's going to turn off the redstone signal and it's going to stay off until we have less than 20% of the capacity of the vault left. And the same thing is true here for the other vault on the other side and both of these go into two redstone links. And then behind the redstone control panel here, we have a whole redstone circuit. And it does look a little more complex than it actually is. <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple in reality. So this is vault number one, and this is vault number two. Those feed into an AND gate, so we need both of the signals to be on. Or in other words, both of them are less than 90% full, so the output torch is on. And so this is trying to turn on the farm, but as you can see, there is nowhere for the signal to go. And that is because we have the automatic override feature on. And what this switch does is it will invert this torch and activate this piston, pushing the bone block in the way and giving the output torch of the vaults somewhere to go. In this case it goes through the block into the repeater and into this redstone link. And that redstone link is connected to the actual on switch of the farm, which is back here. The same place it was the last episode, over here. So yeah, that is basically it. In this configuration, the farm is going to keep running until we have more than 90% of the capacity of the vaults filled. And then of course, these two links from the vault is going to turn off, turning off the output torch and turning off the farm. This redstone here is just the on switch behind that redstone lamp. And then we have an extra line here, which just powers the lamp underneath. Since, you know, normally if you have a button on a lamp, it's only going to stay powered for as long as the button is powered but I kind of wanted to make sure that the lamp stayed on if the farm is running and we manually toggled it. So it's just a, a nice little bonus feature to have. Oh yeah, and this could have easily been a lever, but I, I think it's a bit nicer to hit a button rather than flick a lever. I do hope that made sense. I know a lot of you guys are going to be interested in the redstone. And if you have any other suggestions for the farm, then let me know. We still, of course, have lots of work to do around here, but look at, look at how much bone meal we have. This is crazy. And this is in each vault as well, 12,000. Plus, I've already taken a bunch out. Plus, we have two double chests, <laughs> one on each side, just for some manual extraction until we set up the automatic belts here. So I mentioned that Penrose Central is built in a very intentional location, and in particular this block right here, which is minus 419, minus 188. You know what, standing on track is probably not the best idea. Um, hello. <laughs> Hi. So welcome back to the past before we have a station. And I'm going to explain why we chose the specific block uh, somewhere over here. I lost it by now, but it's somewhere on this, somewhere over here. So I mentioned that there was going to be some non-negotiables in this build, and I was referring to, of course, these pillars which are already constructed, as well as the bridge back there. So it just so happens that this pillar also lines up with the center of this pillar, 
And where we're standing is X minus 419. That should also be the center point of the doorway to Penrose Central, or it will be the center point of the doorway to Penrose Central. So that is on this line right here, this axis on the X coordinate. Also, whenever I'm building such large structures, we always build in odd numbers. So for example, if you have a doorway, it's, it tends to be a good idea to build it five or three or seven wide, and that way you have a center point. Whereas if it's four wide or any even number, then you, well, you have a center point, but it's not a, a full block. So we have the X coordinate for the Y coordinate. We have all these tracks here laid down at 67. Uh, basically where these entrance and exit tracks come into the station. This is Y67. We also established as a server, as Trifecta, that the trains are never going to be taller than nine blocks tall. Just so that everyone's trains fits in everyone else's station. So nine blocks at a maximum, and so anywhere a train passes, we probably want to go 11 blocks at a minimum. So as for the height of the station, which is gonna be above, of course, we can probably be pretty safe to double 11, so 22. That takes us up to Y89, we're on 88 right here. So here is gonna be the minimum, minimum height of the station. That seems a little high to me, to be honest. I may go lower one or two blocks, we can afford to sacrifice one or two blocks in the Y coordinate. I think as long as we leave at least 11 blocks anywhere a train can pass is going to be a good rule. Although I do really want to have tall ceilings down there. So we have the X and Y coordinate. The last one is the Z coordinate. Or basically how far back from the entrance point we need to build the station. So since the entrance pillars are really the only anchor point that we have, I decided to lay out this weird selection of blocks. <laughs> it's going to make sense in a second, trust me. So if we count the distance between these two pillars, it's five blocks. Remember, an odd number. And then we have a three wide pillar, then five blocks, then three wide pillar. But maintaining this distance all the way down and putting pillars at that distance all the way down, I think it's going to be too cramped. I really want this train yard to be a wide open space. So I decided to leave an extra gap, but we still follow the same rules of the odd numbers. So instead of a five wide gap, it's now a seven wide gap and then we leave only one, then another seven, then probably another pillar right here. And that feels like a more acceptable distance between the pillars here after the entrance point. And then we repeat that pattern, seven, one, seven, and then another pillar, and then seven, one, seven. And this point right here, I think is gonna be, yeah, this is where the center of the station is gonna be, the terminal point. Although of course there's gonna be a lot more down below, I still haven't figured out yet. But this point is minus 419, minus 188. And that is why we placed the station right here. But you might also have some other questions, like how do we get the passengers from the terminal down to the platform level down there? A set of stairs would probably be the safest option, but we are gonna use the elevator pulley. Brand new in the Rise and Shine update, it makes it very simple to travel vertically. All you have to do is build out your elevator, glue it together, give it some redstone contacts, and I think some contraption controls. And then finally also rotational power, which I'm assuming goes in this side. But yeah, rotational power is not something that we have close by. So I think it's appropriate that we have the station generate its own power, and we can use this power to generate not only the elevator, but maybe some other cool contraptions that we might want to integrate into the station, which means that we need to generate more than the bare minimum for just the elevator pulley. So I think the perfect solution here is the steam engine from Create, which is capable of giving us hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of stress units, depending on how many we have. We're gonna start off with, here with 18. So I've set up two water tanks and basically the way these work is we heat water into steam. That's gonna be sent through the engine and power a shaft. And this is gonna rotate and this is how we get our kinetic energy. But there are several different factors to consider in this setup. And one of those factors, one of the most important factors, is, is our heating method for the water. So we're back here in the nether. We're trying to get some blaze burners. We, it turns out we had run out completely, so I brought half a stack. That should be more than enough. And we're done here. Oh, I'm so tempted to go and get those wither skeletons. But I hear that Lashmac actually has a wither skeleton farm which we are definitely gonna have to check out at some point. So for heating up these tanks, you can either, either use a passive source or an active source. Uh, passive sources include things like campfires and magma blocks, but those don't generate as much heat as the active sources do. 
And you know what? These are extremely loud right now, so <laughs> we're going to put them in at the end. But yeah, we are going to be using blaze burners, which uh, will generate a small amount of heat just in this state but will generate even more heat if we give them some type of furnace fuel. So we are going to feed them one of the best furnace fuels, which is lava. The way we're going to generate our lava is via pointed dripstone. Similar to the way that we get our clay from mud, that does mean we need to have some lava sources above the dripstone for it to drip into cauldrons and from there we can pipe it out of the cauldrons and into the blaze burners so because we have 18 blaze burners we need a little more than 18 uh, pointed dripstone since pointed dripstone is able to produce one bucket of lava every 18 minutes on average and the lava bucket will burn for a thousand seconds which is 16 and a half minutes approximately so we need a little more lava than we do with blaze burners so we have 12 lava sources for every 9 blaze burners should give us a very small buff buffer to work with and should ensure that at least when we're in the area uh, we'll never run out of lava. So we'll have to find 24 sources of lava to put above the dripstone. I'm really hoping there's still some up there. Isn't there? We use this as part of the bone meal farm, right? Oh, I don't know if there's 24 sources here. Is there some more through here as well? Tiny bit. Let's see if we have enough here. Eight more? Are we going to have eight more in this pool? It's going to be close. Uh-oh. Three short? Two short? Oh, we're fine. <laughs> we're fine, we're fine. That was the last one as well. So I'm using copycat blocks here to uh, block in the lava sources. And I found a really cool trick with the copy... Well, not really a trick, but I found that the copycat blocks do let light through. They are transparent, so I used that in a couple of places in this build to uh, hide some glowstone in various locations. And before the episode started, I did make a slight modification to our bridge out the front. As you can see, it's looking a little uh, bland in the before shots here. However, after making some of the modifications, I think it's looking 10 times better. I also removed the mangrove wood that was in the middle pillars, and we now have stripped oak. In fact, yeah, you can see a little bit of the glowstone coming through here. It's really super effective at night time. And yeah, right under here is where we have the glowstone. I think it's that block is a copycat block and underneath is glowstone. And there is copycat blocks all over the place in here. I love these things, <laughs> but you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, maybe not so much on the interior, but definitely the exterior. Like all of these, these are co copycat blocks. They're just such versatile things. Yeah, like on the window, window ledges. They are like all over the place. Yeah, even for this little trim around this, just to not have a full slab stick out the whole building. Anyways, back to our lava farm. It looks like I picked up one too many. So, so we would have been fine after all. Oh yeah, you can already see. Look at this, we're already generating a bucket of lava. So it is random, but on average it's 19 minutes. I think I said 18 before. Yeah, it depends on the random tick of the pointed dripstone. So I went ahead and figured out the next part of this uh, build here. So what we've basically done is connected up some fluid pipes to the cauldrons, which are going to pump the lava into a small buffer tank right here. This is just a 1x4 tank. So to transport fluids, you do need to use a mechanical pump, and you have to feed it rotational power, as you can see here. So we have a mechanical pump right here on the end of the fluid pipe, and we're just sending some cogs up straight upwards, and we're going to use the power generated from the steam engines itself. And I'm hoping it's going to be self-sufficient. Coolcat said he ran into an issue where if you leave the area, then it's possible for the lava to run out because you're within or you're out of the random tick range of the lava and the pointed dripstone. So that might be something we have to address because if that happens, then we're basically in a cold state and it's not going to restart itself without player intervention or some sort of supporting system. But for now, we are going to do without and uh, we're going to see how it, how it fares just with... Uh, just being able to self-sustain. Okay, so before the rotational power, the other thing we do, of course, need is water to fill the tanks, and that is how we generate our steam, and that is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Apparently, you can waterlog the the copycat blocks. Uh, we want them here and here. 
So with the mechanical pumps, you can also pump straight from an infinite water source. So all we need is three blocks of water, right? And we can also power this with a cog wheel. Probably just connect up with a shaft and that connects the two pumps together. And of course we want the water to be sent into the two tanks right here. So I think you can do it from any side. I guess we're just going to go, we might go into the middle here, I'm not sure. So once we get some rotation, the water should be taken care of. The other thing is of course the lava, which has to be pumped into some buckets to be fed into the blaze burners. We can't feed it as liquid. We have to give it as an item. So I believe the best way to do that is to pump it into a spout. And the spout is able to pour lava on the depot. If you have a bucket, it's going to fill the bucket. Let's place our bucket on there. And then we're going to have a double stacked depot set up like this with a andesite funnel on the bottom. And this funnel, we want to filter for only filled lava buckets. We don't want the empty ones to filter down. Oh, and we have to change the rotation here so that items go from the top depot onto the bottom depot. Now it's time for the blaze burners once again. And now we can set up the mechanical arm, which is how we feed the filled lava bucket, which is going to appear on this depot into all of the blaze burners. And then we want it to also place the empty bucket back onto this depot to be filled by the lava spout. So we want to take items from this depot and send them all into the blaze burners. We have to click every single one here. We're going to have to get underneath for the middle. Oh, and that clears the selection as well. Oh, I didn't mean to place that. We got our advancement though. <laughs> we got the advancement. Okay, let's try this for like a third time. Click all the blaze burners since we want it to round robin the lava buckets. And remember, these things are going to burn for approximately 16 and a half minutes. The burn time of the lava bucket. So they don't need to be filled all that often. Uh, so take from this depot, supply into the blaze burners and then supply also into this depot. And that is going to go upside down. And oh, we got we got two advancements. Okay, and then finally, we also have to give this rotational power, which can only be done with cogwheels, unfortunately. Then we can just come around the tank here with a vertical gearbox, connect up some cogs, and we should be good to go here, right? Everything should be connected. All the pumps are going the right way. The last thing we have to ensure is the pumps are spinning at the correct speeds, or fast enough to supply the boilers with enough water. So there are minimum RPM requirements depending on the boiler tier. I don't know exactly what our tier is going to be, but we are going to add a rotation speed controller. Since I don't think the rotation from this is going to be all that fast, it's just that it generates a lot of stress units. Now we can give all the steam engines their shafts. Oh, this is going to look so cool. So I've also added two sets of encased chain drives coming from the engines, and that is going to feed along to our rotation speed controller right here. And that should be everything hooked up. We are ready for the first test. And uh, we also should have a decent amount of lava built up by now. So I believe all we have to do is jumpstart the system by uh, feeding the boiler some water. Can we do that manually or do we have to pump it in? How are we, spo how are we supposed to start the system without water? And we can't, we can't put it into this thing? Is it really necessary to use a hand crank for this? If we even have one still? Okay, right on here should be enough. Nope, <laughs> we are overstressed. Uh, we're trying to power too many things at once, I think. How about if we disconnect the lava pumps? Now it's gonna work, nice. We get the puddle collector advancement. Oh, you can see the steam engines. You can see the steam engines, that is perfect. Oh, that is perfect. Okay, so the, the blaze burners are not gonna have any, any fuel right now. They're just in the smoldering state, which is not very much heat, and we're already out of water. Okay, let's try to give the blaze burners one bucket of lava just to get started. And we'll keep turning the hand crank and hopefully we should be able to stop turning this and it's going to stay on once we give this thing enough water. Oh, we got another advancement, the powerhouse. Something is happening. Okay, we have to put the connection... Oh, another advancement. We have to put the connection back on the lava pump, which is going to give it, feed it to the spout and then the mechanical arm can feed it to the blaze burners. We need to connect this up here without being overstressed. It looks like it's working, right? Can we let go of this and it's going to stay spinning? Yes, perfect. No. <laughs> Maybe we have to give it a little more. Yeah, we have to give it a little more. Hold on. Let's also increase the speed on the rotation speed controller. Maybe that's going to do it to like 96 RPM and disconnect this again. Let's try it. Let's try it one more time. That should have everything spinning a lot faster. Because the, the faster you spin the pump, the more water you can 
pass through. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, put this back. Now we're in business, nice. Yeah, you can see the water level is rising slowly. And we have a level four boiler here, producing 65,536 stress units for nine engines. And I also disconnected this one just for the time being. Let's see if we can connect this again and still be stable. Okay, this one is level two now. The heat is rising. It seems to be going well, right? It's just a question of, is this pump spinning fast enough to supply enough water? And according to the tooltip here, we maybe could do with a little more water. So maybe let's try to bump this up to 128. Let's see how we do with that. Oh yeah, now we're at three bars of water. Three bars in each. Maybe we need an extra pump for this. Oh, and this is potentially also another issue. Look at this, the mechanical arm is just taking the, the filled lava bucket putting it onto the depot, and because it's filled, it's letting through the brass funnel. I don't think there's a way to filter this thing, though. But I guess it's not really an issue. Yeah, all of the blaze burners look like they have fuel. So now we just need to wait to see if this thing is fully stable on its own. And it would also be nice if we had a proper engine room for this. And just like that, we now have an engine room here in Penrose Central Station. <laughs> so much building this episode, it's crazy. But yeah, check it out, it follows mostly the same as design aesthetic as the existing station. And it gives us the size that I think the station really benefits from. So we have here two little raised entranceways which take us up to the level of the lava. We're using these brass scaffolding blocks which I'm not too sure I like in the engine room. We might switch them out with the copper variant which I know also exists. But yeah, for now we also got an entrance on the opposite side as well, which is also raised. Still, of course, a lot of interior development left to do in here. And we have to figure out a floor. I uh, It's not going to stay stone. I might actually raise the, the level of the flooring area after this point. It might be quite nice to... Hello, zombie. It might be quite nice to have a, a staircase in here to raise the floor one or two blocks. We got it switched off right now just for the sake of the replay. But I think I managed to get the engine all the way up to 190,000 stress units, 194,000. Once we uh, enable the rotation speed controller all the way up to 256. So, but uh, yeah, we have to jumpstart the system again. I'll make sure to give you guys an update next episode, but at least in the limited testing I've, I've done already with, with this thing. It seems to work pretty well. But yeah, I think this is also a really good point to wrap up the episode. And this one took me forever to make. For various reasons, um, I'm, I apologize for the delay, but uh, this is in fact the eighth episode, or sorry, the eighth iteration of this episode. I uh, restarted this thing multiple times, and this is basically the combination of all my attempts <laughs> into this one mega episode. So this is kind of a lesson in perseverance, right? If you guys are going through anything right now, which is probably like 99% of you, doesn't matter what it is, just keep trying. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other and eventually you'll make something. <laughs> is this the perfect episode? No, absolutely not. There is always room for improvement. And so if you guys have any suggestions with the build, then do let me know and we can be sure to implement things. But we did eventually get... Oh yeah, we need to figure out some light. And I do have some skylights up here, but... Yeah, we've had multiple creeper explosions already in here. Yep, if at first you fail, try, try again is the lesson of this episode. <laughs> and with that, I'll leave you guys for now. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next episode of Trifecta. Look into my it's eyes, Lush. No, 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 wear your mask. Social distancing, one and a half kilometers. No, kilometers. One and a half meters.